Uh, Andy Lutz, he's a research and development principal engineer at, at Advanced Cooling Technologies in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He has a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Lehigh University and has been working in R&D and product development at ACT for six years. His primary focus has been on advanced thermal management systems incorporating heat pipes, phase change materials, and other innovative heat transfer technologies. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be uh, describing an experiment and development that we've been doing here at ACT to develop uh, high heat flux CCHPs. In this case, um, we developed and tested a prototype high heat flux CCHP uh, compared to a baseline uh, conventional CCHP geometry. Um, so the outline of my presentation, uh, it'll be fairly short overall because it is just one experiment, but it's a, it's been a pretty successful uh, effort to develop this high heat flux flanged CCHP. I'll talk about um, the topic background and introduction to the problem that we're trying to solve uh, briefly and somewhat vaguely uh, discuss our proposed concept. Then I'll describe the prototype that we fabricated for this project. Uh, I'll describe the experiment uh, that we went through and some results and conclusions. Um, I'd like to thank uh, NASA Marshall for funding this as part of an SBIR Phase 2X. Uh, the technical monitor is Jeff Farmer. Um, so the need for high heat flux uh, CCHPs is coming from uh, increased power density of electronics and spacecraft in general. So uh, here at ACT, we've been working on ways that we can extend the limits uh, in terms of heat flux for CCHPs uh, for aluminum and water CCHPs. So in previous work, uh, we've been able to move beyond the typical 10 to 15 watt per square centimeter limit for aluminum ammonia CCHP and using a hybrid wick design uh, in the evaporator, which is the same thing we're doing uh, in the experiment for this project and this presentation. Um, we previously developed some aluminum ammonia CCHPs capable of up to 50 watts per square centimeter. Um, but by using titanium water CCHPs, we can uh, get heat flux even beyond that level. Um, and these, these CCHPs are limited by critical heat flux in the evaporator. Um, the typical CCHP is, for space, uh, a grooved heat pipe, which consists of uh, grooves running the whole length of the heat pipe. So we have, in the bottom left, I'm showing uh, the geometry that I'm talking about here. So for this work, we're defining the heat flux as the total heat uh, divided by the flange area. So that's the whole flat surface that's being heated. It's not specific to the diameter of the heat pipe or anything. Um, and then you can see uh, this is a scale drawing in the center of the groove pipe profile we're using. It was a 5 8 inch outer diameter heat pipe uh, for this work. And there's either 40 or 42 grooves. Um, but with only the grooved geometry in the evaporator, uh, the heat pipes are limited by uh, critical heat flux, where the, the boiling of your working fluid, uh, the vapor forms a blanket and limits the liquid from returning to the hot, hotter spots in the evaporator end. So we are proposing to solve this problem by adding a uh, wick material with a smaller pore size. So we're incorporating in the evaporator end of the heat pipe, um, either screen or sintered powder in order to hold liquid there um, and also communicate tangentially uh, between the grooves, which isn't really possible if you have only grooves. So in this experiment, we made one conventional CCHP prototype, which will just have grooves uh, for the whole length of the heat pipe. And then the high heat flux prototype that we fabricated 
incorporates in some way a screen mesh, which is a wick with a smaller pore size in the evaporator end of the heat pipe. Um, I'll describe the prototypes. So the prototypes look the conventional and the high heat flux design look identical. Uh, on the outside, here's a picture of one of them. Uh, they're 12 inches long. Uh, the evaporator length uh, and the flange length is one and a quarter inches, and it's uh, one and three quarter inches wide. So the total heat transfer area of the flange is uh, 6.45 centimeters squared. Uh, we used a uh, copper flange, uh, although it's a fairly thin material, so we're not counting on conduction in the tangential direction. Uh, very much. And we attached the copper to titanium using S-Bond, which is a uh, mechanically activated solder. Uh, we tried some other materials and some other ways to bond the flange to the titanium and had a lot of trouble with um, CTE and some uh, decoupling of the two parts uh, mechanically when we heated them. So our first efforts were unsuccessful before we uh, started using this mechanically activated solder and the titanium and copper combination. Um, I'll move on to describe the experiment that we conducted. So we took both of these two heat pipes. Uh, the evaporator has a flange which can be heated on one side. So we perform two tests with each one where we're heating the bottom of the evaporator flange and one where we flip the uh, upside down and we heat the top of it. So we wanted to um, distinguish any uh, effect of uh, tangential flow or uh, eliminate the effect of or investigate the effect of uh, the height of the diameter of the heat pipe and the tangential flow of the working fluid uh, and make sure we have no major discrepancy there in uh, the environment we're working in, which is Earth's gravity in, out in the lab. The prototypes were slightly inclined, uh, I think less than a quarter inch uh, with evaporator elevated over the condenser. Um, we had a longer uh, four inch condenser block, which is two pieces of aluminum clamped onto the outside of the condenser. Uh, and we controlled heat pipe temperature um, we measured a point centered in the adiabatic section, and in order to maintain that at ADC for all of these experimental points, uh, we used uh, liquid nitrogen flow through the condenser block, and that was our heat sink for these experiments. Um, we conducted the experiments by uh, just allowing the heat pipe to achieve a steady state uh, and slowly increased the power, the heat level that we we're putting into the evaporator end. Um, so in order to uh, calibrate ourselves, uh, we first took the conventional CCHP uh, geometry, uh, the titanium and water design, and uh, tested it at several different uh, elevations against gravity and several different uh, fluid charges. So we started by calculating the fluid charge that we should have in the grooves, but we wanted to verify also experimentally that we don't have any uh, excess fluid, which might lead to having a puddle in the condenser and might show us a better or erratic performance of the heat pipe. And we wanted to also verify that uh, the heat pipe limit that we we're fighting in this case was not the capillary limit. We wanted to make sure that uh, we dried out in the evaporator because we were critical heat flux limited rather than uh, facing the capillary limit. Um, so I just have some of the data which shows how we chose the fluid charge and elevation to conduct the final experiment with. Um, and then on slide eight here, I have the raw data that we collected. So we were measuring uh, the voltage into some cartridge heaters uh, in a block that we used and convert that to power. So using the conventional CCHP, 
we started around 100 watts and uh, into that six and a half uh, square centimeter flange. And the performance looks pretty good. Uh, I believe you guys can see my cursor. So our delta T is uh, less than five degrees C in that case. Um, and then as we step up power, we move to 200 watts, 250 watts. Uh, we see the delta T uh, from the evaporator to condenser end. So these were measured um, on the ends of the heat pipe, uh, just thermocouples on the outside surfaces of the heat pipe. Um, but by the time we get somewhere around, uh, I think, 300 watts or so, our delta T is actually increasing to over 10 C. And then uh, we have dry out and erratic behavior beyond that. And you can see our evaporator temperatures uh, starting to increase. So we can only push the power here up to 375 watts, roughly. Uh, and on the next slide, I'll show what that corresponds to in terms of the heat flux into that flange. Whereas when we move to the experiment with the high heat flux, CCHP, which has a hybrid wick uh, and has porous material in the evaporator end in addition to the grooves, uh, we can actually start out the experiment. Um, we did some other experiments before this, but around the level where we left off with the conventional heat pipe, 375 watts into the same flange area, and the delta T is maintained uh, well below 5 degrees C for many of these steps and below 10 degrees C uh, for as, as high as we could go. So the power supply we had on this day uh, limited us to a little under 600 watts, but that's gonna correspond to, on the next slide, about 90 watts per square centimeter. Uh, whereas if we look at the two uh, baselines, so this plot shows when we had the the flange facing downward or upward, we're calling that uh, top heating and bottom heating, respectively. Um, at heat flux of around 40 watts per square centimeter, we see the grooved titanium water heat pipe is exceeding a uh, 10 degree delta T, uh, and then performance only gets worse beyond there, obviously. Um, whereas we can continue to increase the heat and heat flux into that flange for the hybrid wicks high heat flux CCHP up to uh, 90 watts per square centimeter uh, and never exceed a 10 degree delta T from one end of the heat pipe to the other. Um, so this is showing our promising results, uh, pushing beyond conventional CCHP uh, heat flux around 10 to 15 or even a, a high heat flux uh, aluminum ammonia heat pipe that we could make might be around 40 or 50 watt per square centimeter. Um, but if higher heat flux is required, uh, we can use the hybrid wick evaporator design and a titanium water heat pipe uh, to push to 90 watts per square centimeter at least, uh, as shown by the work here. And that's actually uh, the entire presentation uh, and summary of the results that we have. Pretty simple experiment, just comparing uh, two prototypes. If anyone has questions. Uh, hey, thank you, Andy. We appreciate the presentation. Um, Bill, do we have any uh, questions on the live stream? Uh, yes, we have one just popped up a couple minutes ago. Uh, why did you use LN2 to cool the heat pipe? And do you consider that to be pretty excessive for an 80 degree C evaporator? Um, yeah, the, there is no reason. I think that it just had to do with uh, the chillers that were available um, on the week that we were doing this test, really. Certainly no need for LN2. Okay, thank you. Um, see, I don't have any questions now. Let's give it another minute or so for people to uh, 
get an opportunity to type some questions in. Yeah, I've got one for you, Andy. Um, so what makes the uh, porous evaporator design more effective over the uh, traditional grooved wick? Um, so I would say that I, I don't know how much I am supposed to give away here. I would say that allowing uh, some tangential communication, though, between the grooves is the key benefit. Okay. Does it have anything to do with increased surface area, perhaps, or was it really just having that additional connection to the, the grooves? Uh, it, it could be some of both, the way the geometry is in the evaporator. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Vivek. I had a quick question uh, in regards to the copper uh, mesh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the copper centered mesh and, and some of the issues that you were having in terms of trying to get the, the mismatch uh, to properly weld together. Have you, tr did you tried an adhesive, adhesive or something like that instead of going through more of a mechanical type of uh, construction? Okay, so um, that's, it's not the mesh that I'm talking about inside the heat pipe. It's this uh, flange here on the outside of the heat pipe. Okay. Um, and the S-Bond mechanically activated solder. So uh, it, it's, it's a solder, I guess. Uh, mechanically activated is just... Uh, it needs some sort of uh, vibration and friction in order to, uh, I guess, cause whatever reaction uh, forms the bonds between it. I'm, I'm not tremendously familiar with that. I just know we tried a traditional solder first, and uh, we ended up, because of a combination of its melting point, and we, we overheated our flange, and then once the, that happened in the CTE, the flange grew a little bit more. Um, this kind of a runaway situation. Um, but we also, had, we added like this cut um, in the copper, so it's kind of a, a semi-flexible flange as well. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have some more questions from the chat. Uh, was the wick made from center titanium? It, the wick was made from a titanium screen in this experiment. Okay. Another question. How, how do the effective radii of the groove and centered sections compare? Uh, so the pore radius in the centered section is much smaller than the grooves. I'll say at least one order of magnitude. Probably more. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question on here. I'm, I'm, I may be reading it incorrectly, but uh, let's see. For the conventional unit, is it boiling limit? I'm not sure what they mean. Is it boiling limited, or what? Or what's the yeah, limit? Yeah. Is it the boiling limit of the heat pipe? So. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Critical heat flux in the evaporator. Um, based on the experiments we did to uh, calibrate in terms of varying the uh, fluid charge in the heat pipe and the uh, angle or elevation against gravity, we believe that it is. And we, we did those experiments to kind of convince ourselves that we um, aren't dealing with the capillary limit, at least. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have another one. What is the length constraint? The length constraint of the overall heat pipe is what I'll... They're, they're the length constraint of the evaporator. So that's something uh, that we do want to investigate is uh, how, how does this um, idea or concept that we have uh, vary for a longer or shorter evaporator length because it certainly is going to be 
dependent on the evaporator length still. And I think we would have to change our um, design of what we're doing with the the porous media in the evaporator section, depending on the length of the evaporator. Okay, I have another question from the chat. What is the G load limit on this? Um, I would think it should be just the same as a conventional grooved heat pipe. I don't think there's that what we're doing in the evaporator really has an effect uh, on the overall heat pipe performance under that scenario. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another one from the chat. Are these heat pipes commercially available yet? If not, what is the time frame for making them commercially available? Um, so, I would say, yeah, they would be commercially available. If the design, I mean, there would be some design step. Every CCHP is a custom part, um, but I think we would certainly be designing and selling them to any customer that we can find. Sounds like a good business plan. <laughs> Okay, I don't have any more in the chat at the moment. We can take another, uh, we've got a little bit of time. I guess we can take another minute and see if there's any uh, last minute questions. Yeah, Andy, I've got another one. This is Warren. Um, so what are the disadvantages, um, if, if any, uh, of, of going with this high heat flux uh, heat pipe over a, a conventional heat pipe? Um. I, I'm not sure there are, are disadvantages is because a conventional CCHP like aluminum ammonia for space is still going to be a very expensive part. So like the, the minor disadvantages would be um, some complexity in the fabrication and production. But for space applications, I don't think that's, um, I mean, since the baseline part is going to be so expensive already. I don't think that uh, the minor cost increase would be anything. Okay, thank you. 